Mathias Masterclass Deepa Mehta. It's such an honor to be sitting here next to, here next to her. Uh, I was at the premiere yesterday. It's amazing. Fall down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's try not to fall down. I'm going to take this mic away. Well, um, I'm just going to start with a very brief introduction because I'm sure that most of you are very much aware of her career. But let's just, you know, just to warm us up a bit, I'm going to read uh, a little bit about her, her story. Um, the Indo-Canadian Mehta is one of the most respected screenwriter, director and producer of our times. Uh, thus, he will receive RIP's honorary award for lifetime achievement later today at the City Hall. Her latest film, The Anatomy of Violence, came to RIP directly from Toronto International Film Festival. The film was screened yesterday at RIP. I hope that most of you were there, uh, which was the European premiere. Is the sound okay? Is it too loud? Okay, good. <laughs> The film explores one of the most infamous crimes in India history, the brutal group rape and murder of a 23-year-old woman in a bus in New Delhi in 2012. The film combines fact and fiction, and 11 of the actors improvise scenes in cooperation with Meta. Her award-winning films are played every major film festival, and many remain audience favorites. She's best known for her element trilogy, Earth, Fire, Water. Other films include Bollywood Hollywood, Heaven on Earth, and the epic adoption of Midnight's Children from 2012, Salman's Rushdie's prize-winning novel, uh, which is also screened at RIF, um, along with Beepa Boys from 2015, uh, a tough, stylish gangster film. Her work challenges traditions and stereotypes and is always daring, fearless, and provocative. Metha is both a rebel and a humanist. Her Indian Canadian roots, along with a philosoph philo philosophical background, makes her approach to her subject at any given time unique. Well, now enough of listening to me. We are all here to listen to this uh, amazing woman sitting next to me. And I just want to start with a, a, a question about, uh, well, your journey from, uh, well, up to here. What uh, took you to do this film, Anatomy of Violence? If you could tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm trying to think. <laughs> Seriously, uh, how many of you saw the film yesterday? Okay. And... Uh, were there any men who saw it? Oh, that's great, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a film that I think uh, the reason I made Anatomy of Violence is because um, I felt very strongly that it's a time and place for uh, women and men to have a vision that is a singular vision. This is not about uh, a film that's only meant for females, or it's only meant for against men. That's not the point. I think we're at a very important point in history, and uh, it's, it's of the utmost importance to me that in this journey forward to end violence against women, we, we really need as a, to be humanitarian before we are segregate ourselves. And therefore, I'm really glad there's some men here. Uh, we, I like men. I mean, you know, you guys are not bad. <laughs> but uh, and, but we're, we're here on earth for a reason. I, I don't want to feel that uh, I'm just speaking for females. I, obviously, I'm a woman, and uh, I think I, I know I'm a feminist. But uh, before anything else, uh, like Tori said, I feel I'm a humanitarian. That's very important for all of us. Uh, my films have been eclectic. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of a... Uh, accidental filmmaker. I was doing uh, uh, my master's, I finished my master's in philosophy from Delhi University and I uh, was going to do my PhD and 
decided uh, to help out a friend who was making documentary filmmaking films in India. And the films that he was making uh, were about uh, family planning, how to plan your family. There's a ministry in India called Ministry of Family Planning. And <laughs> let's figure that one out. And uh, so I, I decided to help him. And you know, basically I was taking, I was a gopher. I was taking down notes and uh, answering phones and stuff like that. And then I got really bored. So he said, you're a terrible receptionist. So uh, why don't you try and make a film? So I said, okay, let me try, you know, a one minute documentary on how wheat, you know, wheat, uh, corn and wheat, it's a grain, how wheat grows in India. So I thought, my God, how the hell am I going to show a film about how wheat grows? <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I think that's when I discovered the magic of cinema. Because obviously it isn't about wheat growing in slow motion or whatever time lapse or anything, it's not that. It's about the waiting. And it, so I said, okay, let me look at the farmer while he waits, let me look at the farmer's wife while she, you know, while she waits. Everybody's waiting for this thing to grow and it takes six months. And, uh, and I thought this is wonderful and I can do it in one minute. So it was a real challenge and it was interesting and it was, uh, it was fun, and I said, I think I could, I could, I could get into this. Forget about a PhD in philosophy. You know, who wants to do that? So I told my parents uh, that, uh, and I think I mentioned this to you, Elizabeth, the other day. That I told my parents that I wanted to give up academics and wanted to become a filmmaker. And this is in Delhi, you know. And, and uh, my father, uh, he said, um, you know, that's fine. If you know you feel very passionately about it, do it. But remember, a very important thing he said to me, and he said, remember there are two things in life you will never know. One is you will never know when you're going to die. And the other is you will never know how a film is going to do, whether it's successful or it's a failure. And he's absolutely right. Because expectations, the way we get into film, we might have passion for it, we might have, you know, we might have feel that we have a cause, but uh, the reality is that it's really a tough business. And to temper our expectations is extremely important. And that's the biggest lesson I learned. And uh, it's not that you stop being passionate, but it's about be realistic and know why you want to do it. You know, not, I didn't start making films because I felt I had a message. Not at all. I feel that, I, I felt that the reason I started making, a, making films was because I had a story to tell. And I did not want to stand on a platform because otherwise I would make different kinds of films. I mean, there are wonderful films that are made by activists and there are wonderful documentaries that are made by activists and, and women who are committed and men who are committed. But uh, for me, what intrigues me is story. Always a story. And so if that, that desire to tell that story is strong, then you're not thinking completely of being a success or not a success. Because that's, that's up, you know, uh, I'm an atheist, but that's up to the gods and, you know, hopefully good critics. I mean, who knows? Uh, but you know, that passion is what has driven me. It's always been story. So everything starts for me with a story, and usually a story that I'm very curious about. So if I, if I want to know something about, um, I hear a story about Iceland and I'm really curious about what makes Iceland the, soci the sociological you know, place that it is, finds itself in right now, then I would love to do a film on that because I feel that I'm gonna take two years to make a film. I might as well do it on a subject that I learn something about. So it's a, it's a discovery and it, every day becomes, a, you know, you have your story, you have your screenplay, but each day becomes a discovery. And that's what makes film really interesting because it's a commitment for two years or three years of your life. You know, if you're, if you're lucky, it's two years. Uh, otherwise, it takes about three years and uh, when you've got really good filmmakers sitting here and uh, it's, it's, it's a commitment, and it's a commitment that needs not only passion, but it also really needs staying power. 
li a little bit uh, about that. I'm just catching what you're saying about the story. And okay. uh, well, we all were at an uh, interview with you recently in one of Iceland's new newspaper, where you say that uh, this could be your last film. Mm -hmm. And we hope that you're still curious. Uh, you know, that's the stories. other thing that I want to talk about. Don't read, you know, believe everything you read. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, oh really? <laughs> it's, uh, I, I mean, I think I did say to the journalist, not yeah. to, to a Canadian journalist who's, who's wonderful, mm -hmm. but I did say that right now with Anatomy of Violence, usually when you finish a film, uh, in my past, I've already got the next film planned. Mm -hmm. I'm either working on a screenplay or even thinking about something. But with an finishing Anatomy of Violence, I really felt that right now I want to, uh, I, I can't think of anything else to do right now. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant. I didn't, uh, uh -huh. you know, maybe I won't make another film, but it's not a categorical imperative. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we are sure you will. But, well, uh, um, I want to know a bit more about the, the methods that you use when preparing your actors. Mm -hmm. That's something quite special. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I, you know, I've been called many things, and it's, uh, but one thing that I'm, uh, I really, really uh, care about are my actors. Uh, I think that the relationship between a director and a performer is, uh, is the most important. I think that, you know, yes, of course, you have a screenplay, and that's the foundation of everything. But after that, it's, it's the performances, and it's the relationship that actually brings that performance onto, onto you know, give it dimension. And uh, I love my actors. I mean, it's, uh, I, I think it's, it's such a brave profession. I mean, I, I, I'm in awe of men and women who want to be actors because there's, in, there's an inherent, uh, you know, build up of rejection in the process, which is so difficult. But can you imagine, we're talking about passion, the amount of passion it needs to be an actor? Because, you know, out of 10 times, maybe, you know, eight, you, nobody will want you for the role. Not because you're not good, but because perhaps you're not good for that role. But as a, as a director, I mean, I'd go, I'd be really devastated. So I have an inherent respect for somebody who wants to put themselves out there. It requires such, uh, such nerve of steel. They might not feel it, you might, because actors are generally quite insecure as well. Uh, but uh, they, they really, uh, they have nerves of steel. They have such a belief in what they do. And the different ways that actors uh, work with directors and di directors work with actors. And what you were talking about was, uh, uh, I found out about 10 years ago, a really interesting method of working with actors. And it's, uh, uh, you know, we've grown up with, I'm sure, are you familiar with Stanislavski? Yeah, of course, you know, method acting, instinctive acting, in method acting, the character, you, you know, the actor immerses themselves totally in the character. And about 10 years ago, I was, uh, I was with a friend in, in Delhi, and she said, um, have you read the Natya Shastra? So I said, the what? And she said, the Natya Shastra. So I said, no. And she said, well, you know, you should. And I started reading them. The Natya Shastra, N-A-T-Y-A is the first word. Shastra is the second word. And Shastra means text or books. And Natya means performance. So these are books that were written 2,000 years ago, if you can imagine, about the art of performance in India. And they, they cover every aspect of performance. So there's stuff about theater, there is about dance, music, production design, uh, you know, costumes. And it's, you know, it's like 2,000 years ago, somebody sat down, I know who sat down, his name is there, but, uh, and wrote about how you can bring the, or you can try to bring the perfect performance to the stage. I mean, obviously there were movies there, but it's, and the way he described it is, um, and I'll tell you a little story that goes with the Natya Shastras. In, in Hindu mythology, we have, uh, we, have a, we have the creator, who's Brahma, 
the guy who made the world. I don't know why he's a guy, but still. <laughs> uh, um, and then you have Vishnu, who's the preserver, who preserves the world as it comes into existence. And uh, then you have Shiva, who destroys the world. So these three guys got together and they created the world and they were up in Mount, you know, up in heaven or wherever and saying, oh, this is, uh, you know, look at it. Everybody is, look at the world we've created. We've done a really good job. Men, women are so happy. Everybody has something to eat. Uh, they've, got, they've got a house. They've got a roof under there and there's stars and there's moon. And it's, it's perfect. And then Brahma said, but there's something lacking. And so Vishnu said, what's lacking in this world? It's perfect. And he said, you know, it's very boring. So he said, what do you mean the world is boring? He said, look at it. It's really boring. Um, he said, what do we need? We have to make it not boring. And Brahma, in all his wisdom, said, we need drama. And that's where Natya Shastra began, that in order to, to shift the way we think of our world, is perhaps why we need drama. And so this, they got this guy whose name is Bharat Muni, and uh, this is all 2,000 years ago, and, it's all, uh, and said, you write the text on, on drama, the dramaturgy of this. And uh, so one of, uh, Shiva said, uh, why him in particular? And he said, well, he's, he's got 100 wives, and he's got, He's got 10,000 children. Anybody who knows what a family is knows what drama is. <laughs> so I thought that was really bright. <laughs> and therefore, he wrote what's called Natya Shastra. And what the basic thing that I took away from it, thanks to my friend, was uh, that the Natya Shastra is sort of uh, divided into, as far as performances are concerned, and this is what concerns us here, is that it's divided into nine essential ras, R-A-S. And a ras is the emotional essence. And according to Bharat Muni and, and, and the Natya Shastra, there are nine essential emotions. And those are, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's love, there's uh, anger, there is fear, uh, there is um, uh, repulsion, uh, there is laughter, humor, there is, um, have I got them all? How many have this? Is anybody counting? Let me see. Yeah. Okay, hang on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. So there's beer, there's bravery, and there is um, hasya, there is karuna, which is a very important emotion, and that is the emotion of compassion. And there's my favorite emotion, which is adbhut, which is actually uh, the emotion of wonderment, curiosity. And that is a solid emotion. One would think that. And tying them all together is, uh, is peace, shanti. So you have the eight emotions that are around. It's like a box. You know, it's literally called a rust box. So you have, you know, each category, you know, they'll have bravery, love, whatever, and in the middle is peace. And what we do with actors, and I've, I've been doing it with workshops ever since I learned about it 10 years ago, is that uh, you don't prepare with the script. So we have intensive workshops, but we don't use the script. The, a the actors are very, are trying to figure out their characters. So you work on character, not on a line. So if there's a if there's a character is has to say, uh, you know, uh, actually I'm I'm a terrible person and I'm trying to express love. You actually use the rust, the nine, what do they call boxes, and and you have an actor walk through each box. And I would perhaps tell the actor, go to the box of compassion and say, I hate you. And how do you do that? So basically what you're doing to an actor is stretching the actor and adding complexity. So you do not have just one layer. And this is the building up using the rust box of, of characters. 
And it's so liberating because ever since I've been using it, uh, never ever on set have I, somebody's asked me or an actor's asked me, um, what's my motivation? You know, they, they, they know who they are and what they are. And of course there's room for improvisation, but nothing comes uh, unless it's, uh, it's from a certainty of not becoming the character, which is Stanislavski, but actually embodying a character. So if anybody's interested, I mean, I'd, I'd really ask you to look it up. It's, 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 it's a box that's, uh, you know, it's filled with wonder and it's about curiosity. It's about different emotions that, that there's no one singular emotion that makes us. You know, we, we have, we can have three of them at the same time. And uh, I, I feel it really stretches the director and the actor. So, sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> it was a great answer. I'm sure we'd like to hear even more about it. Well, um, um, I also wanted to know a little bit about, uh, uh, it was a kind of a different form, an anatomy of violence from your other films. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, maybe a little bit about the, the structure, well, the production and your role as a director, uh, comparing to your other films. Uh, it was different, but I think every film is different. I mean, this was radically different in the sense that uh, I, did, I did away with anatomy, in Anatomy of Violence, with everything that I felt as a director, actually, um, uh, that I, I, I was trying to, I was starting to find it cumbersome. As a director, it's why uh, I'm sure all of you, some of you know that, or maybe you don't feel that way, I don't know, is that I find that uh, uh, when I say cut a scene on set, uh, everybody disappears. You know, the, the lighting folks go away, the hair, makeup people go away, everybody goes away, and I'm the only one left. It, and you suddenly realize how uh, disconnected you are with, every, with everybody. And, uh, and I thought I would love to do a film where I'm not disconnected. So the only thing I can think of is getting rid of all the other departments. <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> I said, I can do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, so I said, okay, no hair, no makeup, no lighting, no, uh, no first ADs, no second ADs, no casting directors, uh, uh, no, uh, you know, no sound, uh, just need the camera which has a sound built in, and let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the subject, you know, anatomy of violence, the way we, uh, the way I conceived it, um, lend itself to that method. I mean, I don't think I could do it with any other. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 I think the method should change, and sh not should, it changes for me uh, with every film I do, because every film has a different, uh, uh, the, it, it, it makes, it makes you think differently. Mm -hmm. And it should be approached, I feel it should mm -hmm. be approached differently, and at least I do. I mean, it's not a should or would, but uh, for me it's, uh, so Anatomy of Violence was quite different in that sense, is that I didn't have any mm -hmm. other department. Mm -hmm. And it was, so, it was so liberating. It was so fantastic, because it was my actors, myself, and a camera person. And we could focus on what's essential, storytelling and performance. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Uh, well, I have so many questions, but uh, I see that there's a group of people here very curious about knowing, well, knowing more about you. And uh, I think we will open for questions. I, I was wondering, because I don't have the time, Wilborg, do you, can you maybe tell us when we, we have to think about the time? Um, but uh, I would like to open for questions, and uh, let's maybe collect two questions or maybe three, depends on the demand. And well, uh, should we start? Is Don't be shy. Don't it's be shy, like, please. It's really boring. <laughs> Come on, let's talk. Yeah. Let's have a let's conversation. Yeah. Is let's there anything uh, you're interested in? Do you I'm like Indian cinema? Well, I know that Elizabeth had, so, had a question. She had so many questions before, so I'm sure she has one. <laughs> I'm so curious because I watched some of your movies. I saw Water and Beeper Boys. I enjoyed them both immensely. What made me so curious, you are actually the first director I've met whose film, there are side characters I completely fall in love with. Mm -hmm. And now I kind of understand it when you're talking about those boxes. 
you're yeah. working with them through. It's the auntie in the water, yes. and it's the father in Beeper Boys. Yeah. There's like this really, I feel like everything you're saying in the film is kind of, comes out of those persons in the most amazing way. Mm -hmm. Is it because of, is it something you tend to do or, or work on when you're working with the script and the characters? Oh, absolutely. I mean, for me, if anybody's on the page, they're there for a reason, and yeah. uh, uh, and it's it's very important. It's not about line count. Uh, there's uh, it's it's about character, and if if I know what the purpose of that performer is or the character is, and if the actor understands why she is there, even if it might be for four lines, then that those four lines become luminous. Mm. So everybody in in this you know in the in the film has to uh, has to know why they are there, and that's for me the most important thing to do. So I rather spend two weeks you know doing a workshop, um, whether it's using Natya Shastras or whether it's just getting to know each other, not about line reading, but why, what what the purpose is, and how how do they interact with each other? Then it's. Uh, then it's magic. I mean, that's the magic of cinema. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Another thing I, I find that makes you very rich is the multicultural as aspect of you. Mm -hmm. You were born in India, raised in India, you moved to Canada. And I, th I feel like I can see it in Deepa Boys, where you mm -hmm. have this really grounded understanding of the Indian culture, and also the understanding of the culture clash that mm -hmm. happens there. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I'm just so curious because there is an Icelander who does the music for you in Beepa yes, Boys, Vicky. Yeah, he's great. I'm yeah. just curious, how did that happen? Oh, uh, yeah, Vicky is, yeah, he's from Reykjavik. And yeah. uh, uh, I have, a, my editor is, uh, is uh, Scottish. He's from Glasgow. And he had worked with Biggie on, uh, on a documentary. And when we were doing Heaven on Earth, before Beepa Boys, in yeah. fact, which is a very... Canadian Indian story about domestic violence in yeah. Canada, in the Indian community. Uh, I, I really needed something that I felt um, was uh, was different. I mean, a different feeling to to the background score. And I was telling Colin, my God, I don't know who to go to because they're you know the composers that I've, I've been working with. And he said. There's this really crazy guy from Iceland. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, okay, let's check him out. And we checked out Biggie, and I thought he was fantastic. Oh, he is. So, you know, it's just being open to yeah. uh, uh, the world's becoming a much smaller place, but we're all very particular in our own ways. It's in fact to reflect that. Yeah. But, uh, okay, w one last question, because obviously philosophy and the, the curiosity of what drives people is like a red thread through your pictures. And then Anatomy of Violence, which is kind of a, an epic song mm -hmm. that, that all your former films kind of melt into in a weird yeah. way because they look so different. Because there's nothing pretty to say mm -hmm. about Anatomy of, of Violence, which can be said about all your other films. That, well, at least the mm -hmm. ones I've seen. So. And I understand you say, okay, I'm not. I'm just gonna think of the story and the characters. And but I know you feel especially proud about that movie. Mm -hmm. So th my question is, do you feel like you've said everything you wanted to say ab about the human condition <laughs> in that film? Uh, you know, it's. Uh you're, you're really bad. You're putting me in a, <laughs> in a corner. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, I feel that, and maybe maybe that's what I said it, and that that uh, the you know the, the really bright journalist thought that uh, I'm not going to make a film again. But uh, I I feel that I feel that everything that I've cared about is somehow you know you you you're in a in a space and things happen to uh, to us. They happen to all of us. You know, you go to school, you have you have fights with your parents, and you, 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 know, you run away with your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. And it, life is a, you know, has has a way of, 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 you know, becoming or feeding you. 
in a way, and you feed off it. And, uh, and somehow, at the end of it, you, I felt that uh, with Anatomy of Violence, that I really got to do all these experiences that I've had in my life that uh, finally got distilled in Anatomy of Violence. I be it became clear to me why I made films all over again. You know, you, I, I, you tend to you know, I tend to forget the detail of that. And so I can do Midnight's Children, or I can do Biba Boys, and I can do Water, I can do Fire, or Earth, and, and, and I'm really involved, and I'm really curious, and, uh, uh, but somehow with Anatomy of Violence, it's like I suddenly remembered why I like making movies. Maybe it has something to do with that it's the power of the story, it's, again, the power of something that concerns me hugely in, in life right now, which is uh, violence against women. And, uh, but more than anything else, I think it's about, uh, about not being distracted. As filmmakers, we really get distracted. There's no music composed in Anatomy of Violence. There is no music. So there's, there's suddenly no music, there's no hair, makeup, there's, there are no frills. And I knew that if this could work for me, then, then I, I perhaps I've said what I wanted to say. Because it's so bare. I mean, it's like emperor and no clothes. I mean, can, do I have the courage? Because it does require courage. It's not easy. Nothing is easy about filmmaking. Let's not forget that. And once you, you know, you bear yourself, you bear your soul, and you, because what you're doing is you, you don't have the music, you don't have any of the other stuff that's around film. You know, basically you have your camera person and you have your editor and you have your actors and that's it. There's nothing else. So if you can survive that, then you feel, I, I don't know what else is there to say. No, it's, I think it's lovely. I, and I also think you have a lot of other things to say. I'm just, <laughs> but I'm all, it kind of brings me to financing because I think you're extremely relentless in your work and uh, honest to your story. How does that cooperate with the financing part, with the producer part of it? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, I'm lucky that I'm in Canada now. Uh, you know, and that I made my first film in Canada because I've often said that uh, if India gives me her stories, Canada gives me the freedom to express them. And that's, I, I feel lucky for that. And, uh, but the first film I did, which was a film called Sam and Me, uh, you know, I'd done the screenplay. It was, I hadn't written it, there was a wonderful writer who'd written it. And, uh, and I went to Telefilm Canada, which is our big funding Party in Canada, and is uh, and uh, and the person who was there at that point took one look at me. I mean, obviously I'm coloured, and obviously I'm a woman. And he, and he said, you know, uh, Deepa, you've got everything going for you. You're coloured. You're a woman. It's too bad your script stinks. <laughs> so I said, okay, <laughs> and I didn't get money, of course. So, uh, but you know, we got it through another funding body, but it was very little money. So for me, the, uh, we, we made the film. For me, the high point was that when Telefilm Canada had to give a party for the film in Cannes. So I thought that was great, <laughs> you know, because, it, so there is, you go through that stuff where people like your stuff or they don't, and you say, okay, how am I going to make it? How am I not going to? I'm very lucky. I have a wonderful producing partner. And, uh, you know, uh, he's, he's really, really smart. And uh, after Sam and Me, it, it's, it's also the luck of the draw. George Lucas saw Sam and Me in London. And he said, I love it, and I'm going to do Young Indiana Jones, and I would like you to direct an, ep an episode. So I, he called me, and, I, and he said, this is George Lucas. And I said, right, and I put down the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right, right, <laughs> you know, come on. <laughs> and... Uh, so, but it was him, <laughs> and uh, you know, before I knew it, there I was at Skywalker Ranch, you know, with G George Lucas cutting the film, and and uh, again, you know, and I I really enjoy. I learned a lot. I learned what's possible with a little bit of money, 
I learned that actually for a director, what money does more than anything else, for me, uh, is not buy me a crane shot. It, it actually buys me time. And that is invaluable for a director because the more time you have, the more time you have with the script, with your performers, uh, most more time you have with your editor. Uh, so I, I learned about things like that. And also, it, you know, Rick, who was his producer, was a really good guy. And, and you do, you know, doing those episodes, it was very easy then to, uh, to do a film called Camilla, which was a very big film. For me, it was huge. I think it was like 14 or 15 million dollars. This is a good, you know, 18 years ago or something. And uh, uh, it had Jessica Tandy. It was her last film. It was very big. And, and the film did so badly. I mean, it sank like a Titanic. I mean, you know, you never, and I thought what my dad had said, you never know how a film's going to do. Uh, and, but that's the thing, that when something really hits the rock bottom, what are you going to do then? That's the test. Can you, can you get up again? And, it's, mm -hmm. and believe me, it's not easy to. Because everything is against you that sense you know it nobody likes failures and it's it's a very rough world out there and I'm sure you know that and uh, but it's how badly do you want to tell a story and the next story I wanted to tell was about two uh, two women who were uh, you know who were lesbians in India and that was like very little money and David raised the money and everybody worked on it for nothing or, or everybody worked on it for deferred salaries and uh, because I couldn't get another job after Camilla. There was no way that I could get another film made because, you know, it had tanked. It was easy as that. But then, you know, Fire did really well. So it, it, it depends on what, what happens. You know, some, some films work, some don't. But how, what is your desire to tell a story? How much is that? Is that the reason why you're doing the film? Or is it success? I mean, I think it's a bit of both. We all like success. Let's not fool ourselves. Uh, but uh, when you don't have it, what do you want then? That's the question. Well, I'm sure there are more questions. There must be uh, quite a few questions here. Yeah? Well, I have more questions. If Yeah? Hello. Thank you very much for your film yesterday. I really liked it. And uh, it really touched me. And uh, I really appreciate your choice to, what you said yesterday in the Q&A was, for me it was amazing. You said, um, it's first a comment and then a question. <laughs> it's part of the question. And uh, you said, um, I didn't want to talk about the victim because I didn't want to re-victimize the victim. For me this was um, an incredible thought, really. And. Uh, um, and I have to say also that I think it was a, a high spiritual choice to look for the reasons or to try to understand more why a man becomes a rapist. But didn't you, of course you asked yourself, I think, <laughs> for sure, but were you afraid of being accused of justifying a rapist when you were doing the movie? Or somebody would tell you, you're, you're justifying a rapist, or six rapists, not one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um. It, it, you know, it did strike me, you're right, that, uh, I mean, when, I don't think I was justifying a rapist, but I can understand. No, no, <laughs> you no know? I, 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 that's what I said before. I thought it was a, I think it was a highly spiritual choice, your yeah. choice to go deeper in their lives as a woman yeah. as well, and not as a man, or, that because you said yesterday it took you three years to get over the anger, and mm -hmm. then to get mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. touched by it, and then to make a movie about it. That's, I, I, I know you're not, I mean, Please, no, don't no, misunderstand no, me. No, no, I totally understand. No, and I, I do understand because there have been people who said that, and it's been interesting. There have been actually Indian guys, uh, three of them, <laughs> who said that, uh, you know, we, uh, why, why have we done a film that's sympathetic to, uh, to the rapists? And that was the word they used. And I said, you know, uh, I thought that it's a, it's a film that's unsympathetic to the system that creates a rapist. You're missing the point. It's not the rapist and the victim. It's about the film for me. The reason I did it is, is the society that breeds this kind of violence. So uh, there'll always be people who'll say something. I mean, what do you do? Somebody's ever, now especially, you know, 
is all out on social media. Some people just love it, some hate it. And, and that's, but that's good because there's a dialogue. That's the only thing that I want from this film is that I want people to start talking about a system that actually creates monsters. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, little bit more, more, more about that. Uh, the research you did for the film, mm -hmm. uh, did you work with any of the family members of no. the victim? Or? I didn't work with anybody. I mean, you know, there's, uh, that's a documentary. That would have been very different. I mean, I was doing a dramatic film. So I, we, we'd done the total research of what had happened to the victim. and. But I wasn't focused on the victim. For me, it was uh, about uh, the men who actually perpetuated the crime. Uh, so there was a, there's a lot of research we did on them. But you know, when you when you come down to the bottom, I mean, anybody can do it. Is that uh, there's not much known about them. There's some glimpses into their lives and their the lives of uh, I mean, for these particular men, of particular uh, horror depravity, you know, poverty, uh, uh, no male role models, patriarchy, misogyny, I mean, you name it. It's, it's a terrible existence. But th that doesn't mean that, you know, all rapists come from places of deprivation. I mean, there's some really, you know, the guys who look very rich and wealthy, you know, it's got nothing to do with India or color at all. We have more question. One question here. Yes, Maybe if you would like to have the mic. Where's the mic? I didn't get to see the film because I flew in this morning at six in the morning. But uh, from I, where? From Toronto, <laughs> actually. Oh, <okay. laughs> yeah. Um, and I was writing a screenplay based in India and doing some research last November and met with some production companies and producers there and. They read my screenplay, and, and there was a rape scene, and there was, you know, it it um, dealt with some serious issues, and they the logistics behind getting it shot, and having the Indian government approve my screenplay without me going to jail, <laughs> was seemed like a nightmare. Um, they, he told me that we wouldn't be able to film, or a couple guys, um, what I wanted to film, and I was just wondering how you the logistics behind filming? Uh, you, uh, you ha it's a good question. Uh, what happens in India is that if you want to make a film in India, uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot make it without the permission of the uh, Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. So if I, you know, for example, when I make Midnight's Children or Water or anything like that, you have to give your script into the government. They look through it, they go through it, and they see if there's anything in the script that's detrimental or portrays India in a negative light, it's going to be very difficult to make the film. Uh, so that's what this young girl's talking about. That. Uh, so what was the question? Uh, how did you do your? I didn't ask them permission. You didn't? <laughs> no. Okay. I just did it. You just did it. Okay. Uh, so so, so uh, did you did uh, yeah. you give them like a soft screenplay? I didn't give them a screenplay. No screenplay. I didn't. Nothing. No nothing. permits. No. no. It, but that's what I mean. It, it is liberating. I mean, you had to do it because, you know, rightfully so, uh, that you wanted the financing. That's why you're looking for producers. Yeah. And the minute you start, you know, wanting things is the minute there are a lot of people who are going to say no to you. So I just eliminate that part of it. That's and, great. That's what know, I was thinking yeah. of doing. Just Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Maybe filming more in Canada. <laughs> oh, sorry, one other quick question. Have you gone back to telefilm? Oh, many times. Okay. They've been, and they actually, they, they say they like me, so that's good. <laughs> no, no, they, they're good. They're really, I mean, it's a really good funding body, and, uh, and I think it's changing, and um, uh, no, no, they're very good. More questions? Yeah, one more here. Quick, I have a very quick question about the movie itself, about the last sequence. I don't know if I got it right, but I really had the feeling, then I looked at it many times while I, while I was watching, I was trying to look at details if, they were, if the bus was moving, but I had the feeling that the bus was not moving for, the, for the, all of the last sequence. 
No, yes. no, it wasn't moving at all. I, I, uh, exactly. The, he didn't know how to drive. <laughs> it, was very, it, was, it was one of the crazy things. I mean, this is what happens, you know, you say, okay, so Reish, you're going to be the driver. And this, is what we, this was one of the last things we'd done. So he, he said, yes, 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 of course. And there was stuff, stuff he had to do, which was already, which was on a stationary bus. You know, her coming in, he did all of that. And then, uh, then I said, okay, now, now we'll drive. And he said, ma'am, I don't know how to drive. And I said, oh God. <laughs> and I was pretty much stuck with continuity. So I said, okay, let's not drive then. <laughs> So this is what happens when you go really sort of rock bottom budget, you know, you don't have trailer cars, nothing to pick you up with, you know, but it, it's okay. No, it was, fun. I, think, I think it was a fantastic choice. I mean, whether it happened as a chance or something, it was fantastic, but uh, I, I was trying to look, uh, I thought about it the whole, like the whole last night and all, I'm still thinking about it because it gave me a very strong feeling of, uh, that was when the real performance was w was taking place. Mm -hmm. the, of these men were actually going to do something to the woman, and it was something. It was completely unreal in a way because we knew that the bus was moving. The first time you say in the text in the movie, mm -hmm. on a moving bus, the girl mm -hmm. has been raped, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the bus is not moving. For me, it was an incredible thing to see. Mm -hmm. So maybe it worked out. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> <laughs> No, but yeah, but it's sort of interesting how things like that happen, and you just say, okay, it's all right, you know, we're not going to let it fluster you, or even though I must say I was flustered for a second, but uh, then it, uh, but then you just thought about the, you know, basically there was there were two cameras, one on either side, and we put a you know a GoPro in the middle, and that's it, yeah. and uh, but uh, it just gave more room for performance, the fact we weren't moving. So it That's why I found okay. that it was, uh, it was fantastic for me. Yeah. Okay. It was completely unexpected as well. Yeah. 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 Maybe for you as well. <laughs> <laughs> totally for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm a bit interested uh, about the, well, you're talking about the cycle of violence and uh, it, it has, well, it was a journey for what, what the three years from when you, from where you start? No. You, you no. were at the protests in uh, 2012? Yeah, but, uh, but I made another movie in between, you know, so it isn't that I was sitting with, I mean, that's, mm. that's the other thing. It isn't that I sat with the idea for three years and said, how am I going to make it or not? I mean, I was there when the rape happened. I was in Delhi and I was uh, not a part of the protests. I went for one of the protests because I was, I just didn't know what, I felt I had to participate yeah. because it, it made no sense to sit at home and watch it on TV, what was unfolding. It, you know, you felt that you had to, be, I felt that. And then, uh, you know, then life goes on and I made Diva Boys in between. So mm. it was three years later that, uh, that I felt when somebody approached me and said, uh, you know, you were talking about that, will you mm -hmm. make a film on, on, on the victim and what happened with the gang rape? And I said, no, I don't want to re-victimize the victim and, uh, but I would be interested in mm. making a film mm. on why rape happened. Mm. What, what's the fertile ground that gives birth to rapists. So, so mm. it wasn't sitting there for three years. I mean, it yeah. sounds romantic, but it wasn't, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's sort of life. Yeah, it's like you were saying that, you know, the, well, drama, uh, it's a way to change, well, change the way we think of the world, and you were mm -hmm. doing that with that film. And uh, what I'm what I'm concerned about is like uh, after the film, after mm -hmm. you've gone through this journey, um, do you think that the cycle of violence in India can be broken somehow? Is it the lawmakers or the is it the conversation you're starting? Kind of your expectations. Uh, I know that it's going to be premiered oh, now God. in India. You know, we, I know you don't like this question, but no, I have to no, ask it. No, I know, no. <laughs> No, it's not that, no, no, not, not at all. It's not that I don't like the question. I mean, I think that it's, it would be really childish and naive of me to think that making a film is going to change the world or making, it's not just India, it's all over. You know, it's a very particular film, but it's a very universal film. Let's not think that it's only about India. It's about anybody who's black, yellow, white, anybody, any society, any class. Am I going to change the world with this film? 
I don't think so. That's not, that's deeply unrealistic. But if I, am I going to start a conversation? Yes. That's already happened. And there's something that's very interesting that we're doing is uh, because th the reason to make this film wasn't that people would pay their $20 and go and see it in a movie hall. The reason was that people use it as a tool. Uh, whether it's in schools, universities, NGOs, women's groups, children, violence against children, men's group, anything. And uh, it's going to be released in Toronto, uh, I think on the 20, whatever, 20th of November or something. And we have the opportunity, to, and we're doing this, is to have outside the movie hall, just outside the movie hall, like a phone booth. And people who want to can come inside the phone booth and we have an interactive uh, uh, virtual reality thing going on where you can actually be a part of four scenes from the film. So for example, the young man who's being tied by his father or the young man who's being raped by his uncle or the other young man who's being seduced by his aunt. And if you put them on and you're right in the middle of the scene, we want to see what your reaction would be. Because to engage people, you have to have their reaction. And they have to be, it has to be immediate. So I'm very, so we're going to be doing this and using this all over the world, wherever the film's going to go. To take it just one step further, if I want your involvement as people, I need more than you just going to see the movie. I mean, this is rare to be able to talk with you. you know, I'm, I'm not going to be there each time uh, the film gets screened. But this will be, you know, the, uh, so, you know, it's, we just don't, it wasn't just made for consumption at film festivals. It, we have, we have a plan to use it. So if anybody wants to use it here, feel welcome to. I mean, it doesn't cost anything. We did it for free. Who wants to use a phone? You do it. You're very bright. <laughs> really? No, no, honestly. We have more, one more question. Sean, do you have a question? Oh, you were just saying you want to use the booth. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, that's the reason we did it. Oh, you made me very happy. See, it was worth all the jet lag coming here. <laughs> It would be, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's going to have a wide release like Batman or something, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, but, but, you know, especially like it's showing at the tip light box, which is really, you know, has a conscience. So if there's something similar here, even for a week, the point is to make somebody make a noise, even if they say, if they're inside the booth and they're inside that virtual reality and they say, stop it. The minute you say stop it or don't do it, you have made a personal commitment to do something, whether you know it or not, which is what we want. You know. So how do you take the dialogue further? You know, I, I've done the film and I've, we've thought about this. And uh, so if we can, you know, anyways. That, I'm, I'm, school systems is very important, school, because it, it all starts with children, doesn't it? We have one more question. So showing it in Toronto is not going to change the um, minds in India. It's not about changing minds in India for me. It's changing minds everywhere. Uh, you know, we have our own problems in Toronto. In the back. I feel that, uh, you know, when you think of the way the thousand Aboriginal women who are missing and murdered in Canada right now, it's violence against women. It's not just India. You know, it's going to be shown in India as well. But I think it has to be shown all over the world. I, I said yesterday that, uh, I mean, that this is my mantra, what Bunuel said, which is the minute you're particular is the minute you become universal. I, I say to people, don't worry about, you know, India. We'll, you know, we'll worry about ourselves. You worry about Iceland. And think what's happening around you. And if we all do the same, then we'll have a cohesive world. Now I'm sounding like a politician. Please, sorry. <laughs> Do you want me to save you? Yes. Okay. 
But it's uh, premiered in Bombay, isn't it? Yes, it's, Soon. It, yes on the 21st of, of this month, it's going to be at the Bombay Film Festival. So that'll be interesting to see how that, what the reaction is. Yeah, well, more question here? Uh, maybe just in a comment first to the, to, to the Toronto situation. I mean, already showing the film here in Iceland it falls into an extremely um, uh, active context or an interesting context. I mean, there is every, I mean, there have been very recently like a huge outrage, people gathering in front of the police station because of rape cases here in Iceland. You know, so I mean, of course, this addresses everywhere. And I mean, uh, talking about the where the film should be sent to, you know, it would be interesting to, to give a copy to the, to the, actually the police force in Iceland. They should be, mm -hmm. should be brought into their just educational material even, you know, it would be interesting to look at them. But uh, there was just like, I wanted to say, uh, I found just like so incredibly much inspiring things about the film, just everything, how it's made, how it's approached, and like what you were talking about yesterday with Emilio, the bus scene. And I also I found it incredibly interesting how you, how the film is kind of systematically put up, what you described very briefly, how you kind of, the script is made out of these, all the actors made one, you know, one scene of this, one scene of that, and one scene mm -hmm. of that, and then they come together. And it's just so incredibly inspiringly simple. But then of course the, sim the film is nothing simple to watch or understand, but in the, the essence, and that's also what is so, it's just so truly emancipatory, everything about it. Okay. The, how it's, you know, also what you were saying that you, you know, the, the, lip, the, the freedom it gave you or the liberty, actually that it didn't cost anything. Of course, there's a totally a different thing that coming from someone like you who has made major films and huge film, of course, it's different for someone being a, a first film without having. Totally. So yeah. that, but that's incredibly, incredibly inspiring for me, like to feel that bravery of, of a film director uh, like you to take that position of making film, like you say, for nothing, stripping, just like, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, yeah. This book that you read uh, with the boxes um, mm -hmm. the, that you use as a system or systematically use when you are uh, working with your actors. Mm -hmm. Do you know if it's if I can read it in English? Yes, 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 of course. It's you can get it. I think you could go to Amazon and get it. Oh. It's called the Natya Shastra. That's Fantastic. the text. Fantastic. Uh, and it's a text about dramaturgy. And there's a chapter about the ras, R A S. Ras means the essence of emotion. Fantastic. And those and those are the nine rasas. And there's a whole chapter on that. Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. It's it's available to all. It's it's pretty amazing. Well, we are running out of time, so are there any burning questions? Um, well, we still have 20 minutes. Oh, I misunderstood this, uh, the signs. Oh, oh, that's great. <laughs> A lot of questions coming up then. One here in the front. Andrea, thanks for being here. I just wonder which is the essence, which could be the essence of violence. Because I recently went to buy some soundtracks and uh, they were in vinyl. I was like, wow, you have soundtracks in vinyl. And then after I bought them, I got surprised myself because the three of them were very violent, were Natural Born Killers, uh, Killing Bill, and uh, Hateful Eight the last one from, from Tarantino, and I was like, why is it that, that we as humans, we are interested in this kind of uh, a violence? Is it that, the, is there something beautiful in, in violence? Is there something that could be there in the primal state, um, a sign of uh, beauty or pain? I mean, is, is there any, any beauty in pain for you? None at all, my God. No, I'm not a masochist. I don't think there's any beauty in pain. I think it's, uh, I think if, if you talk about the rust box and what is the emotion that I feel that um, 
in this particular case that uh, perhaps comes back to what this gentleman was talking about. Is I think uh, what it evokes in me is compassion. You know, it's it's like why do we need it? We don't need it. Life is tough enough without inflicting pain. No beauty in life. Well, I, I have one question more uh, about your position as a, a woman film director uh, living in uh, Canada and having this multicultural background. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't it give you a bit more freedom than the, the, the women who would live in India and be... Uh, Not at all. I no? mean, there are some amazing women directors in India. I mean, it's tough. We have to understand it's tough to make films wherever you are. It's tough for guys to make films, and it's tougher for women to make films. And they can be in Iceland, they can be in Hollywood, they can be in India, they can be in Canada. It's really tough. I mean, it's, it, it's expensive, uh, you know, and it's a whole process we have to go through. I, do I find it easier because I'm colored uh, and being in Canada? No, not at all. It's, it's tough, you know. So it's a tough business. And uh, what, what it gives me and what's great about Canada as opposed to the United States is... Uh, um, is that uh, Canada actually lets you be whoever you are. So I'm very proud to be an Indian Canadian. I don't have to be a melting pot of Canadians. And uh, that's, I think, our, our tapestry, our multicultural tapestry, for which I'm very grateful for. So uh, you can draw you know, two things. I mean, I can draw, like I said, on my stories that are Indian. And they're perfectly Canadian because I'm a Canadian. Mm -hmm. You know, So th that's mm -hmm. what gives me the liberty, mm -hmm. not the fact that uh, I'm in Canada. Mm. Why? It's tough. It's very tough making movies wherever you are, whatever color you are. Mm. So appro approaching the issues in, in Indian society is not easier for you being outside of it, in a way? I don't understand no. the question. I'm sorry. No. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> it's... Uh, um, like approaching the, well, violent, uh, the cycle of violence in mm -hmm. India, for example, mm -hmm. would it be easier to, because you are Canadian, but you're not living in India? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to, oh, so yeah, you see, uh, you know, in... So why uh, do I want to make films about India when I'm actually living in Canada? Well, that would be good to hear that, so yeah. <laughs> it's not uh, really a question, but that's good. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I've, I'm, there's something that really irritates me, and that's appropriation. I don't think that, uh, I think the world is too small a place for me to say right now that I'm colored, so I can never make a film about Iceland. Or is it going to be easy for me to make one? Or is it going to be difficult to make one? The only thing that makes me want to make a film is when I'm inspired by the story and my own curiosity. Whether it's of a, whether I've spent no time in Iceland, but if there's a story that's set here that I relate to, that I can actually go back to, that's, that's what motivates me. The story. <laughs> yes, and it's not about color or appropriation. I mean, mm. I think that, you know, they're, they're amazing, amazing filmmakers who've made things outside their own culture. Mm -hmm. Women, men, and they've done a great job. But, you know, I, and if you start, you know, making them, giving them boundaries and mm -hmm. saying, because you're colored, you cannot make a film about a white person, I think we're really dehumanizing what we stand for. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, any last questions? Yeah, there's one here. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for making the A Life of Violence. It's a really beautiful film and it's deeply moving. And um, I forget a couple of times before, but I also wanted to say it. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you if there was any um, key things that you have taken from your past in philosophy and where, which you're using in your, your process as a filmmaker? Hmm. Strangely enough, I mean, one of, the, one of the aspects of philosophy, and this was in my first year, um, it wasn't, the, and I, I, started, I did my master's in Hindu philosophy, but um, something that stayed with me always has been one of the courses we had to do was a course on logic. And out of everything that I learned or read about, logic is the one that stays with me. And I wasn't even very good at it. But it's the whole idea that, that I think the importance of detail 
and brevity in getting to the point uh, is something I learned in logic. So strangely enough, that comes to mind. Nobody's ever asked me that before, so that's <laughs> interesting. Yeah. There's always the first. Always the first, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure that Elizabeth has the last question. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because she has asked so many. <laughs> I just you. see that she, she's <laughs> no, curious about I, something I else. I might not have more questions, but I want to say one thing because we're discussing making films abroad or with colored people or not colored people, etc., etc. But I connect so strongly to the characters in your film. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any exotic colors, or I've never been in India, so I still, I still connect so deeply with them because they're so human. Mm -hmm. There's like me too. You work with human emotions, and that's something we all have in common. That's true. We, I think, human emotions is definitely yes. something we all have in common. So, and that's why I think I so easily connect with your characters. So now we need to wrap it up because uh, Deepa is going to receive the Rips Honorary Award in, the Thank you. in this afternoon. I'm really uh, excited. What should I wear? <laughs> should, I, should I wear Indian clothes? <laughs> should I wear jeans? Come on, people, help me. Should we vote? What? Yeah. <laughs> Indian, okay. Not Indian. Okay. <laughs> okay. Something warm, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, so, yeah. I'm Just deeply, from the rain. deeply honored. Thank you, Rip. Thank you, Harun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Deepa, for being thank here with you. us. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, fabulous. Thank you. I think, well, it's you who did a great no, job. no, not at all. I didn't do anything. anything.